Come on, Matt, get Matt all the way here. Let's give him up his time tonight. Matt from Hyatt. So thanks, Matt. Um, tonight, very informal, guys, and then yeah, sorry, we'll go Q&A at the end, 15 minutes. Thanks for coming. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. So um, you're pretty young, pretty young guy. A lot of companies under the belt. Reading the bio, can I, I want to go back. Usually I start with, um, um, was there a mother or father that was an entrepreneur? Because I'm always kind of interested to see if there was. Neither. No? Neither. Yeah. My mom worked at a daycare center. My dad was a contractor. So where did the bug come from? Where, what made you start a company at 14? Is that right? First one was at yeah, 14? 14. Yeah, 14. Um, I just, I was born with it, I guess. I started subscribing to Fortune magazine when I was 14 years old. My friends were reading Playboy and Maxim. I was reading about Bill Gates and Steve Jobs and reading business books. Um, if I wasn't an entrepreneur, I'd probably be like in banking. Yep. I think I kind of like the idea of creating value and creating wealth and success and building teams and just innovating. Yep. And what, what like, so for, 14, what was the first company, by the way? Yes, yeah, so the first company is still around, actually, to this day. It's called SitePoint. Oh, right. Um, which was so, born out of my personal interest in learning how to uh, build websites online. So as I was learning how to code HTML and which web hosting company to use, etc., I started publishing all that information online. It very quickly became one of the most popular websites around that topic around 1999, 2000, within weeks of launching, literally, the USA Today named it the website of the day. LA Times wrote about it. Windows Magazine, which at the time had over a million subscribers, did like a full page write up on their website. They had no idea who all, all I was. What did mom and dad say when you showed them this stuff? Um, they didn't think it would last. I was like yeah. showing, some, some, showing them some of the checks I was cashing. They're like, wow, this is amazing. But and we got Len Lenny, Lenny Mayo here with Lenny in the back. So Lenny was uh, early days, he was with you guys too? He was one of our early investors in SiteCoin. So points. some crazy 14 year old kid comes to <laughs> Lenny and said. No, he's not there, he was 16 when I met him. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, saying I need, I need some cash. Is that how the story went? Uh, I met my co-founder, Mark Harbaugh, who's Australian based. I'm um, yep. in 1999. We incorporated the business together, became business partners, and truly after raised a little bit of capital. Unbelievable. So SitePoint, yeah, it's still like big global success right now, right? Yeah. And then. So from SitePoint, and I, I kind of I'm going to jump around. It's like um, uh, Quentin Tarantino movie. Uh, can from SitePoint, what? And you have a number of these businesses. Is it kind of like a point where you just like get a bit bored with what you're doing, and then you just put a CEO in and go, I'm on to something else? How? How? Is it, how? What, what's happening there? It's not about boredom. It's about solving a problem that nobody else is solving, and just seeing that opportunity and being frustrated that it doesn't exist. Yep. Um, so Hyatt was actually born out of my frustration with the recruiting industry. As 99designs was scaling, we were paying recruiters hundreds of thousands of dollars a year in fees. We disliked using them. We knew the software engineers disliked working with them. Yep. I actually went on AngelList, and at the time there were something like 450 different startups in the recruiting category. Over the course of two weeks, I went through all 450 startups looking for something that would help solve the problem. And fortunately, what I found was everybody was playing around the edges of the problem. They were doing code testing and video interviews and applicant tracking and back ground checks, but nobody was really going for the jugular and going for the success fee that the recruiters were charging. And that to me seemed like a huge opportunity that was untapped. So um, before we jump into the hired story, um, the after site point was not, was that 99 designs? 99 designs, yep. And, and I think because you know, I've interviewed Patrick, interviewed, um, uh, well, Patrick, who was else? Um, and 99 Designs hosted on like a number of my events. So I was quite familiar with the story. Is, is the story goes that when you were kind of monitoring SitePoint, you just saw that problem for the design competition started happening in SitePoint, is that right? Yeah, so basically what was happening, we had a very active community of designers um, in the SitePoint forums. And as a way of practicing their design skills, they started playing a game called Photoshop Tennis, where they would basically play ping pong, competing around design projects. Eventually, some of the other people in the community saw this activity happening, saw these talented designers basically spending hours and hours of their time 
uh, creating designs for nothing except prestige. And they started offering cash rewards for actual design work. And the designers just jumped on this opportunity for ability to meet a new client, earn a couple hundred extra dollars for a logo or web page design. That's how the idea was born. And as we saw this activity happening, we started charging fees for it, initially $10 and $20. Eventually, we decided to build a whole suite of software around it, make the experience like really, really user friendly, and spin it off as its own separate brand. So can you, can, you, can you talk about, like, um, I guess, the, you know, I already saw the question up there about what, it, I'll just jump to it straight away, what is the success to creating marketplaces? I think the success to creating a marketplace is the same as any other company. First of all, you need a really big tar addressable market. If you're going after a super niche business, you can't build a really big successful company. Second of all, you need product market fit. So the customers have to be willing to pay for what you're selling. Third of all, you need to have the people and to execute against the business. And fourth, you need capital. We have all of those lined up, then you can go hyper grow. So what, what did you take from, say, like from SitePoint that you, you knew to try and kind of implement straight into 99designs? Was there some learning in, in the growth of SitePoint that could just be translated? Is there any similarities aside? There were pretty unique businesses because SitePoint was a media and publishing company, so it wasn't a two-sided marketplace like 99designs was, but we had a huge, huge advantage in the early days because we had literally millions of designers on SitePoint every single month who were able to feed into the 99designs community to fulfill all the design requests put forward by the small business owners who were coming to us. Initially, all the small business owners were coming to us entirely through organic word of mouth. I would spend almost nothing on marketing in the early days. And the reason why that is, is because we had created such a next level shift in the industry that had never existed before, both on a pricing level and the services provided. So prior to us existing, you know, for SitePoint, we paid 10,000 fucking dollars for the logo. Don't now you could get a logo for $300 yeah, yeah. on 99 designs. Yeah. And second of all, when we paid $10,000 for a logo, we didn't get 100 logos to choose from, we got three, yeah, yeah. we got three. And all of a sudden, with 99designs, we created this massive step function um, that created this viral word of mouth effect. We saw dentists and coffee shop owners and online entrepreneurs and internet marketers utilizing 99designs, which was really unique. I think where people struggle oftentimes with their business is they create something that's 20% better or 30% cheaper. And there's a lot of friction in switching against an existing service that's well known. But if you create something that's like 99 percent cheaper or like another example of this would be like Plenty of Fish, which is a very successful dating website found in Canada that just acquired by Match.com for $550 million cash. Um, before Plenty of Fish, every single dating website charges subscription fee $20, $30, $40 a month. But Marcus was smart enough to realize that he could create a much bigger business and a really, really successful business by eliminating the price to zero. And that was a game changer and the business just grew organically entirely because I had disrupted the Match.com, the eHarmonies, and the OkCupids of the world. So um, tell, can you talk through like the growth of 99designs? When did you like, so it sounded like you pretty much knew you were a winner straight away, is that right? Yeah, we started charging money for it around 2006, 2007, initially just a $10, $20 fee for posting contests. Eventually we needed to get involved in the transaction to secure uh, both parties in the deal, um, and that's when we decided to invest in building a software platform around it. Um, but it was very organic. Like I, we can't say, I can't say, Mark can't say that we came up with the idea ourselves. It's something that was incubated within the community. We kind of capitalized on this behavior, created a much better experience, much better brand, um, created the customer support infrastructure, and then launched to the world. And and then, so when does Patrick come in, the the now CEO? How did, how did all how, how did the like? Since we're talking about hired, obviously, can you talk about the scaling the people, I guess, as, as you went? Yeah, so Patrick came on uh, not too long after we launched 99designs. We opened up a San Francisco office because the majority of our customers were in North America, and we wanted to have a president for North America. And Patrick um, spent a couple months working out of the Melbourne office here, and then eventually moved himself and his family over to San Francisco to run uh, North America for us, and then eventually got promoted to CEO. And, and can you just go through like some of the, the pains you had in scaling? Like everyone's dream here is to pretty much start from the garage and go to you know, the, the numbers of, of employees you've done a uh, number of times. Can you go through some of, um, I guess, the strategies to do that as best as possible? Yeah, so I'll use Hired as the most recent example. And that's what I've spent the last four years on. Um, initially, it's definitely an uphill battle, convincing your first three or four people to join your company when it's unproven and unfunded. 
is super difficult in any environment, but especially in San Francisco where people can get a job for $150,000 or $200,000 a year by just tossing a dart down the street. Um, so the way we actually solved it is we started recruiting from middle America. Our very first engineering hire came out of Nashville, Tennessee, and we relocated him over to San Francisco. So we went fishing in an area that everybody else was ignoring. Yeah. And once we had the first 10, 15 employees, the momentum started to build itself and it kind of de-risked the business for the next few people joining the company. But initially it was very, very hard and we had many people reject offers from the company. And what, so you, you build this product, how, how do you get like, you know, your first paying customer, how, how, did it, how did it all come about? And, you know, I've seen the client list is a massive, you know, the who's who of, of tech. How did, how, did this, how did all this come about? Yeah, so I'll walk you back to the very beginning of the business um, in April of 2012 when we were launching. We knew this was like a risky endeavor and we wanted to have logical points along the way where we would just stop the idea altogether. So the first the major risk point that we had was actually will developers, will candidates sign up for this? So all we did in the early days was create a simple landing page uh, to collect personal information and we emailed a whole bunch of developers. If they didn't sign up at that point, we would have killed the idea and that would have been that. But sure enough, they signed up. We thought that was done, perfect. Next step, employers. We thought that would actually be the easiest part of the business because everybody was hiring in Silicon Valley. So we went on different job boards, we found out who was hiring, we started emailing a whole bunch of hiring managers, come to hire, we have all these de great developers looking for jobs, you don't have to give us a credit card number up front, you only pay us if there's a success fee. And all we got back was silence. Not a single employer signed up, just shocking. So what we ended up doing actually was going to their investors. We went to Greylock, Sequoia, First Round Capital, Google Ventures, and we had them email their portfolio companies on our behalf, using the existing relationships we had in those firms, in order to sign up the first couple dozen employers on hire. This is a big problem in San Francisco, getting a developer, right? You would have thought everyone was gonna come back I to you. I thought yeah. the getting a developer would be where the business failed, not the, the man side of the business. So that was a really interesting learning. And we had to hack our way around the system to get the credibility early on. And then and when you had these influences do the reach out, Change, change everything? And that changed it. We got the first couple dozen employers signing up. The third test for us was can we get the employers to talk to the candidates? Sure enough, we have two sides in our database. That's one thing. It's another thing to get them to connect and start interacting with each other. So right before Burning Man, my co-founder basically hit the switch, ran off into the desert, into the playa, yeah. and, and we launched the first batch of Hire.com where we had 88 engineers who ultimately ended up receiving $30 million in job offers from 24 different companies, including Quora and Dropbox. Nice. Um, we had set a goal of $10 million in job offers, but we had far exceeded it um, in those first two weeks, which was a fantastic proof point for us. How, how do you stop the disintermediation? How did you like, I mean, every marketplace has this bit where you're worried that they can just go around you and, and, and talk to each other, especially when you're trying to create a yeah. communication tool. Yeah. So initially we just viewed it as an acceptable risk and we didn't put in any barriers. Um, but eventually we came up with this idea of a candidate signing bonus, something that no one had ever created in the entire recruiting and hiring industry. We would basically pay the software engineer when they told us they got a job through our platform. Initially that fee was upwards of four or $5,000. Since then we've reduced it somewhat. Yeah. But we created this incentive for them to provide valuable information to us that will allow us to build a client. That you're then charging the employer for? Exactly. Yeah. Nice. Let me go through some of these. Uh, how can you ensure companies can find the best talent when arguably the best talent aren't active job seekers? That's a great question. So I think what Hired does is we actually get people to start looking for a job when they otherwise wouldn't. The shocking stat is that 87% of people worldwide are unhappy and disengaged at their job. The US isn't much better, it's at 70%. And of those 70% of people who hate their job and don't like waking up in the morning or showing up at the office on Monday, only 20% of those plan even attempting to look for a new job. And the reason why that is, is because of the friction involved. You're looking on Seek, you're submitting your resume into a black hole, you're interviewing, you never hear back from the hiring manager, you're asking your friends to introduce you to hiring managers. It's a really awkward uh, process. And what Hire does is really streamlines the entire process end to end. So people who otherwise wouldn't have bothered looking for a job end up on the Hire platform because it's such a seamless, 
transparent, painless experience. And a classic example of this is a great story, actually, is one of our very first engineering hires, Nate Clark. He worked at Pivotal Labs for four years, which is a very big, successful software engineering agency. Six months prior to joining Hired, he had actually tried to find a job the traditional way. He went to a recruiter, he went and interviewed a bunch of companies, he did full day on-site interviews. At the end of this process, which had dragged out for over four weeks, he got an offer that was 30% less than what he was currently making. His wife was pregnant, he was about to have a new child on the way, he couldn't afford to take that pay cut, so he decided to just stay put at his current job. And this story plays itself out over and over again. People who would switch jobs if it was easy enough and if they had that transparent information up front, but who didn't because hire didn't exist. So tell me some other great stories there. I know you've got a few <laughs> lined up. It's like we're, we're doing our bit for hire. This, to this, so let me hear some of these other great stories that have come through. Yeah, so one of the cool things that we did in the early days at Hired, uh, drawing back to our experiences at 99designs, was giving great gifts to our clients. So at 99designs, when we made an engineering hire, we'd often get an invoice for $25,000, $40,000. And the recruiter, as a way of saying thank you for doing business with them, would send us like a six pack of donuts. <laughs> like a six pack of donuts. And like, realtors give you balls of champagne, they give you these fantastic gift baskets. Why can't like, the recruiters and vendors that you do business with do the same as well? So at High Head, what I decided to do was send everybody balls of Dom Perignon champagne for the candidates to celebrate the new job with their coworkers, as well as the clients, for, as a way of saying thank you for doing business with us and trusting our marketplace as a source of great talent. So we actually became the largest buyer of Dom Perignon champagne in the state of California. <laughs> yeah, we, we, our office manager got a phone call from the CEO of BevMo, like inquiring what we were doing. Like, are you with Jay-Z or Kanye West? Like, what's going on? Like, we, we literally had an entire room in our office stocked floor to ceiling with Dom Perignon cases at one point. That's a great story, a great story. Um, Flip, oh, Flipper, we haven't talked about Flipper. So how, how, like, I understand that, you know, 99 Designs kind of spun out of SitePoint. How, it was Flipper the same kind of, was the same, same scenario? Exactly, so Flipper also originated within the SitePoint forums where we had a classified listing marketplace essentially where people were paying small fees to list websites and domain names for sale. And we decided to actually productize that and build out a full auction platform, which we launched us, I think in the summer of 2009 it was. That's still going kicking ass as well, It's right? going really well. It's yeah. expanded to app sales as well, which is a really hot category for us. And there's opportunities around other small business and digital assets and creating liquidity for both sides. Is there a bunch of other things on SitePoint you haven't figured out yet? <laughs> Another few businesses? TBD, TBD. Um, so, oh, I, yeah, oh, I think that was the one. How can you ensure companies can find the best? We already did that. Rest in peace, Harmony. It's a great one. Thank you. Um, Flipper and 99 both evolved from established model on SitePoint. Um, what was your proof of concept for Hired? Or went through that? How are you going to make companies embrace remote? Working, working remotely, I guess. Um, <laughs> that's what you meant? Yeah? Yeah, I imagine. So, ha, ha, like, you know, the trend towards remote working, how, how does this play out in? Yeah, it's a really interesting question. I think if you start off with a remote culture on day one, you can build the systems, tools, and processes to make that possible. It's very hard to do this switch over later on in the company's life cycle. Um, either you have it or you don't. So I think it's a decision that the founding team has to make early on. I mean, remote is fantastic because it presents a great arbitrage opportunity at the cost of labor and just opens up the pool of people that you can hire to a much, much higher number. Do than you guys have remote workers? We don't. We don't, we decided to have offices. Um, and all of our engineering and product management is based out of San Francisco. Don't you have an office in, office in Canada as well? We have offices in, we have offices in uh, almost 17 markets now. So Seattle, Toronto, London, Paris, Melbourne, Sydney, Singapore, Boston, Chicago. And Melbourne headquarters, you said for APAC, with how right. you going forward? That's right. And a lot of us, all Zero and all, all your old buddies at Flipper and everyone's on there now. Why, what, what, do you, what do you find coming back to Melbourne you know, I, I hear like a lot of people, well, there wasn't events like this, whatever. What, what do you find has happened to this ecosystem since? Early yeah, I days? think in the last five years, like the number of co working spaces that are popping up, the number of incubators, accelerators, the number of investors who are willing to put money and make bets on small companies has increased exponentially. A lot of developers are now saying they want to be entrepreneurs, so they're leaving companies that they've seen being successful and are now deciding to go out on their own and try their hand at being an entrepreneur and starting a meaningful company. Um, I don't think that existed at quite the scale or the volume that it has in the past uh, five, six years. 
is there something that we could be doing a bit better or something that you would you see that from San Francisco, I mean, I know it's totally different, but something that you think Australia could do better or Melbourne could do better? I think the biggest thing is like risk capital. And the great thing about San Francisco is there's so many millionaires that have been successful as a result of the Facebooks and Googles and other multi-billion dollar IPOs that then end up becoming angel investors and just spreading around small bets across dozens or hundreds of companies. Um, I think right now, in, even like in Australia, once you need a $50 million check or a $100 million check, you're probably looking outside of the country for that capital. So that's the, that's the problem, right? Capital, yeah. And then, but on the other hand, yeah. it forces a lot of discipline, right? Yeah. 99 Designs didn't raise money for its first three years of its life. Sidepoint and Flip, I have never raised any significant outside capital either. So we're, just, um, we're, more, we're probably more resourceful. It teaches you to build a real business in the early, uh, from the first days, forces a lot more discipline and creative thinking. Or by in San Francisco, you have people like doing crazy catering and like the austerity panda, the job box, like all sorts of stories, like founders flying around on private jets and first class and like, buying tables at clubs, charging $3,000 to the corporate credit card, that's a lot harder to do when you don't have 10 or $20 million in the bank. Agreed, agreed. The, um, as a marketplace that provides talent, how have you identified and recruited talent for hired? Well, that's interesting. You said you went out, uh, out um, Midwest. I think kind of covered this bit. This is a bit of a random one, but I'm going to give it to them. What do you think about using chatbots for customer service? I don't have any experience with it. Yeah, that is shit. It's terrible. It's terrible, <laughs> guys. Um, how can you ensure companies can find the best talent on this? Zuckerberg wants to eradicate human diseases. I'll talk about the hiring one. Yeah, I go. mean, uh, the good... I think the, the biggest shock in starting hired is like 80% of companies like are absolutely shit at hiring. Hiring managers have no clue how to interview. They don't move up with any sort of uh, efficiency in the process. They leave candidates hanging. They don't, they aren't great at onboarding employees when they do join the company. They have no idea what the fair wages are in their market, so they underpay or overpay for talent. Um, I think it's a huge, huge problem, a huge area of improvement. You know, at Hired, we have probably 50 plus people managers across the company now, and training every one of those people managers to be effective leaders by held, holding effective one-on-ones, doing performance reviews, et cetera, is critical, but also teaching them how to recruit and hire well. So, you know, you can create your own interview process internally, but we actually use a book called The Who that we hand out to every single one of our hiring managers and walks through a proven structured process around how to hire somebody. Every question you ask, each step of the process, how to conduct effective reference checks, how to create a scorecard, how to grade candidates against a scorecard. It's not about liking somebody, that's a nice bloke, I'll hire him, or he seems like a cool person I can have beers with. That's not what hiring is. You're trying to hire somebody who has a successful track record of achieving or overachieving goals and ones that overlap with your organization's needs. Are you starting out very process driven as you, as you go more and more deep in this company? Like, I mean, as startups, we're kind of managing this chaos and then we go figure out that we need to, you know, it's get on It's been, uh, we knew that from the early days at Hire that this business would scale very rapidly. So we were very, very diligent in the early days of putting in place processes that we didn't have at Hire 99 Designs. We were doing quarterly executive offsites and strategy planning sessions when there was like 25 of us. We started doing performance reviews on a quarterly basis company-wide when it was 40 of us. We hired our first director of HR when the company was at 50 people. Um, so creating these systems like early on really allows us to have a much smoother ride scaling up. And these things like you learn from experience, like HR is like a really dirty word, I don't need another bureaucrat, I don't need a paper pusher in my company. But HR can actually be like a really valuable business partner, not just compliance and filling out papers, but like somebody that can be a trusted resource, you can have your employee onboarding experience, you can make sure you're paying people well, um, you can make sure that if career pathing for all your employees, these are things that are really, really important to think about. You want to find out, you know, when your key engineer walks out one day because they're getting paid 50% more across the street and you didn't do enough to like look at the market and give them a pay raise when they obviously deserved one. How do, how do you create these processes? Is this, is this like an OKR, like a top down or bottom up kind of, how, how are you creating the processes so that everyone's still on board and, you know? Yeah, OKRs are very effective for quarterly planning and cascading use, of goals. So you use them? Yep. Yeah, OKRs are very, very good. But it's much more than that. It's about thinking through the holistic employee experience from the day they walk into your interview room to meet with the hiring manager for the first time to the exit interview when they move on to their Can next Can you tell the job. audience what they are, just so in case they don't know what OKRs are? 
So OKRs are basically a way of setting goals within the company and holding people accountable. Um, Google and a number of other organizations use it. There's multiple books and blog posts written about the process. And you can also buy off-the-shelf software that really facilitates this. So OKRs are really good from a cascading standpoint. Say you have a goal of $100 million a year in revenue, and then you have individual goals for your marketing team, how many leads do they have to generate, your sales team, how effective do they have to be at converting those leads into revenue. You have your finance team, how effective are they at collecting the dollars and the invoices from your customers. And it creates really, really strong alignment across the organization, which gets really, really hard once you scale beyond 50 or 100 people. Once you no longer know everybody's name, function, job title, and what their task list looks like for that day, you have to create like some structured processes to make sure everyone is running in the same direction. I mean, a company is like a robot. If people are rowing in this direction, people are rowing in this direction, you end up with a whole mess. and and you don't grow as fast as you otherwise would be able to. So this is the one-on-ones as part of it as well, right? I'm, I'm just, I'm, I yeah, just, one-on-ones yeah. are really important. It gives the, the employee an opportunity to post about their accomplishments. It gives them an opportunity to tell you about things that they're frustrated with so you can remove roadblocks. It's a conversation about their career pathing. Do they want to move into management? Do they want to move into more senior individual contributor roles? It allows them to voice things that they see around the company that you otherwise might not know. Like, if they were the boss, what things would they change in the company? Like, what are they hearing, et cetera? So like, we encourage all of our managers to hold one-on-ones 30 minutes once a week with every one of their direct reports. And how does, the, how, how does like, such rapid scale come into this? So when I interviewed the you know, uh, co-founder of Slack and then there was a customer experience manager, I can't remember the lady's name right now, but she basically said her, her job role at that time with Slack's growth was going so fast was to literally package up her job and give it to someone else and then, then do the same thing again and again. How are you managing what you're doing and all that, you know, that one-on-one while you're just going, while you're exploding? Yeah, so if, if people are the foundation of a successful business, as a founder, you're literally going to spend 30 to 40% of your time interviewing and convincing people to join your company. That becomes the number one priority. And people say it is the number one priority, but oftentimes they don't act that, like it. Um, like if you're not willing to leave your sp spouse or partner at the dining table to go take a call with a potential candidate, um, then it's not your priority. I've done that multiple times. My wife was super mad <laughs> when I came back. Dinner was cold. And he didn't even accept our offer, by the way. Yeah. But I tried. Um, you have to be able to make those sacrifices in order to build the best possible team. It's also not worth really being stingy, especially if you have external investor capital. So our investors in the early days of hired used to tell us, you know, you're not spending your money, you're spending my money. I want you to go and hire the best people. That means you also have to pay them well. Now, you, 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 got, a, you got a track record of all these multi, you know, million dollar, tens of millions of dollars, successes, global successes, and you have trouble hiring people when you're starting hired. How does the startup here, you know, the co-founder here, manage to get you know, the best technical guy or the, you know, the best business guy they can get? What's, what's your advice there? Yeah, initially, actually, it might make sense to overpay for your first one or two hires. Uh, pay like 90 100% top of market salary. Because the decision that the first couple of engineering hires make kind of set the foundation for your company. They become really, really expensive to unravel later on in your company's life cycle as the code base becomes more and more complex. So try and hire as senior as possible in the early days. Um, and be creative. Like you said, remote is a possibility. A person doesn't have to sit in the same city. Maybe you can find a great person who sits like in the middle of the country, in the middle of America, maybe in Brazil, in Eastern Europe, there's a lot of talent. Um, and you get, was this, is this like a big you know, equity, a lot of equity given away to, to get that right too? It on? depends, it depends. Um, some people really value equity. Other countries, other engineers don't because it's not usual in their circumstances. They've never seen friends who've had successful outcomes. Obviously, in Silicon Valley, there's many people who have lots of friends who have made hundreds of thousands, millions, or tens of millions of dollars from successful acquisitions and IPO events. People value it really highly. In other markets that are less mature in the startup ecosystem and they haven't had these big liquidity events, people are kind of like, yeah, equity is nice, but I have never don't really think it's going to be worth anything because no, no one that I've known has ever gotten paid out. Um, what is it, this is a good one. How is your single, what's your single most important piece of marketing advice? I mean, you said a lot of stuff kind of happened naturally, but when did you, you know, try anything in terms of marketing that worked really well that could be translated, I guess? 
Yes, I think on the marketing side, I mean, the more disruptive you can be as a business, less money and time and effort you have to spend on sales. In Hyatt's you know, first three years, we didn't have a single salesperson getting companies on board. I would just wake up in the morning, log into our admin, and boom, there's Amex, boom, there's Staple, boom, there's another Fortune 500, Fortune 1000 company that signed up. Is that, is that all product? Is that just have the best product you can do? Have the best product, have an experience that's radically better than the next best solution. Not like 50% better, not 30% better, but 10x better. But on the marketing side, I mean, uh, we use multiple channels, referrals, are great if you can implement them into your product. Of the higher candidates, about one third of them come through referrals through alumni, and we incentivize that, and we have built in referral system at key critical stages in the candidate's life cycle that triggers them to invite their friends. Sending them a Bob Dom Perignon, a nice gift box. You know, people post that on social media, they post it on Instagram and Facebook, uh, creates like a wow moment. We had one uh, post recently that went viral and got like 10,000 plus shares. Um, that happens when you create like these wow moments. Um, on our customer service front, we actually give all of them like a $2,000 per quarter budget to create wow moments for customers. And they can use that at their discretion. It's similar to like what people at Ritz Carlton and the other fancy hotels can do. If they see a need, they can fill it. Somebody's sick, they send them a tea gift set. They're, they're had a new baby on their way, you get flowers. Um, the candidate is local, take them out for lunch. Like create these like one-on-one -on -one moments. Um, you don't have to do it like every single time, but like word spreads as you create. Is that like, just this. something you log in in the CRM and then just making sure you're you know, being nice guys about it? Like these well moments, is that part of your like your mission statement? What, what? Yeah, our mission is to get everybody a job they love. Um, ultimately, Hired, the name represents the scope of our mission. It's only Hired for software engineers and data scientists and program managers, but ultimately it's Hired for sales, Hired for marketing, Hired for finance, healthcare, any sort of knowledge worker. How do you build that culture early on and then how do you keep it through scale? Yeah, first of all, you have to define your culture and what it means. Culture is basically the operating system of, of your company. Um, whether you write it down your culture or you don't, it exists anyway, so it's much better to put it down in writing and then think about ways of interviewing and hiring the right people that are cultural fit. Um, but the, really where the rubber meets the road is when you have people in your company that are performing really well, they're your top salesperson, they're your number one engineer, but they're not cultural fit. They rub other people the wrong way, they're difficult to work with. Do you let that person stay or do you kick them out the door? Um, and if you're not willing to kick them out the door, then your cultural values are really meaningless. And a classic example of this is obviously Enron. They had like trust, integrity, and shit written on the plaque in the lobby of their office, but none of that obviously meant anything. So was that, I imagine that would have been hard early on, and now you're just quick when someone's not a fit to get rid of them? We're relatively quick. It's always going to be different and better. But yeah, we're in, we actually have a 30-minute interview with every candidate that comes to our office that specifically tests for specific cultural attributes. So um, can you dig a little deeper? I, 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 when I, I mentioned this to you earlier, there was the founder of Prezi had this, this one thing where he's like, if I think they call it the Hamburg test or whatever, and he's like, if I, if can I sit with this person on a plane for 14 hours from Hamburg to San Francisco? And if the answer was no, then they're like, this guy didn't get a job. Is it, is there some kind of you know inside stuff where you're like, what you're looking for for hide? Uh, it's not about who I would sit with on a plane for 14 hours or who I would go drinking with. It's more about does this person have the tenacity to persevere in the face of obstacles? Do they go above and beyond on the job on a regular basis? Do they put the company above their personal ambition? Are they like self-promotional? Do they have a track record? Of how, how do you get that in, a, in an interview? Is it, There's definitely that structured questions that you yeah. can use to get at that answer. And also reference checks will tell you a lot if you do them effectively, which most people do not do, by the way. So did you kind of have to go back and re, redo So we it? actually have like structured interview questions for every single step of our process that every single one of the interviewers asks and then transcribes into our applicant tracking system, which has been one of the key kind of systems that we built and invested in very early days of the company. So as entrepreneurs, we all think a lot about like all of our conversion metrics. I spend $1 marketing here. How does the customer convert? What's their lifetime value? When do they churn out, et cetera? But you should be thinking the same thing about your people analytics side. How many people do I have to interview to make one paper offer to get one person starting in my office? Uh, where do people drop out in this stage? Are certain people in the company better interviewers than other people? And where do disagreements happen? Um, and a tool like Greenhouse or Lever or Workable can help you get that, some of that data, which allows you to optimize your hiring funnel, which becomes really, really important when you're trying to hire 10 or 20 people a month. Is there like a, do you, do you have like a number of, I guess, uh, psychologists on the team? How are you coming up with that, the right questions? 
Yeah, so we actually used the book that I referenced earlier oh, yeah. called The Who, um, which discusses a process called top creating. <laughs> Is that a good book for startups? It's a brain? fantastic book. It's 20 bucks. I mean, you can try and reinvent the recruiting process from scratch and spend dozens of hours on it and probably not come up with something that's half as good as what you can buy on Amazon for 20 bucks. Nice. That thousands of companies use to hire players pretty consistently. Yep. We'll put, I'll, 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 I'll send this out in the next newsletter, Ricky. Uh, are you looking at doing any acquisitions? So um, just out of coincidence, there was a, group, a couple of guys from MAP, um, Keyshawn, and I can't remember the name of the company, but you bought them. I know Shop you did. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Um, he was too, he's young and a bit too stupid, didn't hang around for all these share options. I think he's a <laughs> in New York, I told him, but anyway, what can you do? So I'm guessing there is acquisitions along the way. Yeah, we've done three acquisitions so far. We acquired a data science team, Job Bob, as well as a company in Paris that was doing something very similar to Hired. Um, we're looking at about one or two acquisition opportunities in a given week. Most of them don't make financial sense to us because it doesn't match up with a crowd roadmap or the people are the wrong fit for the company, but we're certainly keeping an eye open. So the Paris, Paris one, for example, is that part of like a global strategy just to take over? Is it easier to take over an existing business in a, in a city rather than kind of, you know, start from scratch and, and, and you know? For us it was, we really loved the team in Paris, the people that we have hired to launch our market for us any day of the week. So when we saw that they had already built Hired, equivalent on a shoestring and they were getting traction with clients and candidates it was really a no-brainer for us and they were super excited to join the company they wanted to have the experience working for a successful silicon com silicon valley company so that when they go on to launch their next business they would be able to learn how to operate um, a business at scale which is something that they wouldn't otherwise have been able to do if they just stayed in paris in their own little wasn't there a 99 designs kind of knockoff in germany or something that you acquired along the way too yeah, with 99 Designs has done a couple of acquisitions as yeah. well. We did one in Berlin and we did one in Brazil as well. But weren't they like 99designs.de? <laughs> so it was something, it was something pretty No, cool. it was a different yeah. name. Oh. But my favorite, yeah. uh, my favorite yeah. knockoff of yeah. 99 Designs yeah. is actually called 110 Designs. Oh, that's what it was, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's great. Yeah. 11 more. <laughs> <laughs> there you get more. Um, can we turn up the volume? No, you can't. Uh, are you looking to do an acquisition yet? How is yours? What is it? Did this? Turn the audio up. You can't really hear me back there? No, no. Not at all. Oh, there you go. That was better. Me or him? Oh, you're kidding me. The whole time. <laughs> bit low. A bit closer. This is better? This is fucking great. Sorry, guys. <laughs> yeah. Start again. Um, so, so could you hear much of that back there? It was okay? All right. But not too bad. It's a bit faint. Um, so Paris, Melbourne, Melbourne set up offer, uh, setting up an office here. Tell me about, tell me about going into different countries. Yeah. I'm, I'm we, usually, we usually curate these questions, and I didn't do it tonight, so that's fucking great. Uh, remind me that we're doing this next time we're curating the questions. Um, tell me about global expansion, why Melbourne's important, and what's, what's coming up next. Yeah, I mean, we view Hyde as a global business. The more nodes we create in the network, the more opportunities we can provide to the candidates on our platform. There hasn't really existed a way for somebody from San Francisco to land a job in Paris and go work there for a couple of years, or vice versa. The more cities we launch, the more opportunities we create. And we see relocations being a really important part of our business. For example, in Los Angeles, I think almost half all the hires made in that market come from other cities. People get fed up with the high cost of living and the bad weather in San Francisco. They want to live on Venice Beach and a nice apartment without having 15 roommates. Well, um, this is part of the dream, <laughs> right? I'm, I want my dream job, so send me to Paris or whatever it is, right? Exactly. exactly. Um, and now they can move, move to Singapore, they can move to Australia, etc. Are you finding that like, you know, a lot of these guys that you're working with are global companies, that that's starting to happen? Too, like you know, like zero, right? They got offices everywhere. Are they kind of hiring, getting to try and get you to yes, recruit? Yes, that's been one of the really interesting things as we've launched. You know, four years ago, a lot of the companies were Series A, Series B companies. Now they've scaled their growth companies. They're opening their second, third, and fourth office, and because we've scaled with them, they're able to keep utilizing higher versus outgrowing us. Is that is that like you know because this you know it costs so much to get a developer in San Francisco, for example? That, that you're, you're, you're getting used for that, for that same reason to kind of bring in guys from the Midwest or Australia or wherever 
into the San Francisco offices? Um, it's, you can say no. It's just a, no, I mean, yeah. people have different ambitions. If you want to go on a tour of duty, if you want to live the dream and live for a few years in San Francisco, if you want to live in France or London or Singapore for a few years, and we just help facilitate that. How do you shift your focus between 99 Designs, Flipper? Yeah, this is a good question. So how, how, how involved are you still with the other businesses and, and how do you switch between, you know, like... You can only do one business at a time. It's impossible. It's all consuming. I, you know, think about in the shower in the morning, I think about on the weekends. There's no, no on-off switch when you're an entrepreneur. Things are always running through your mind. Um, so hired is 80, 80 hours per week, basically, and I sit on the board of directors for Sipon and Flippa, but it's, it's minimal at this point. Yeah. So do you, like, um, so just key, key decisions kind of thing? Yeah, board of directors. Yeah. yeah. All right. Um, salary is a forbidden topic in Western culture. So many people go underpaid if you don't show initiative, especially women. Which orgs can help fix this? So I hope Hired can play an important part in that. We released a gender wage gap study uh, about six months ago where we analyzed the data and showed that there is a gender wage gap as people move through the career track. Um, not when they graduate from college, interestingly enough, but as they move further along. Um, part of that has to do with the frequency of job switches, but part of that is just, according to studies, women don't ask for pay raises and don't negotiate as much as men do. Um, by having the transparency of salary up front on the Hired platform, we eliminate a lot of that. Plus, we provide salary calculators and reports that help people determine their true market worth. There's also other, tons of other great resources. There's Payscale, I think. Wealthfront has a salary calculator tool. There's a lot of in places we can go for independent research to find out how much people in your market are getting paid. So that's something that you really kind of champion, right? Absolutely. You, yeah. Absolutely. We actually released our uh, diversity data on Hired, you know, diversity.hired.com, and we released not only the gender the breakdown of the company, but also the salary breakdown between men and women to make sure there's no disparity. And has that helped, like, you know, uh, improve, improve things? Is that, what's some success? I mean, we want to lead by example, yeah. right? Yeah. So we did the internal study ourselves. Thankfully, we found that we were on the mark um, and we didn't have many errors that need adjustments. The few that we found were dealt with swiftly and then we released the data and we think other companies should be doing the same once they get to a certain size. You see companies like Facebook, et cetera, releasing their data on an annual basis. Apple is also leading the charge in this area. Um, I think it's really important. Um, you've started three successful marketplaces. Uh, any failures along the way? Any failures that I guess we can learn from? Um, there's been multiple different product things that we've tried along the way that haven't worked. Um, obviously, one of the keys to growth is iterating and testing lots of things fast. The more and quicker you're able to execute against ideas, the more likely you are to find things that do work. So on a product side that we fail on a weekly basis almost at Hired. We do a lot of A-B testing and test new ideas. We've test different user flows, uh, UX designs, etc. Um, so I mean, we, we fail. So how do, you, how do you set something up like that with Hired, right? So you just basically still A-B split test? Still a lot of A-B testing. We have a full-time user researcher as well that g gathers data and does user sessions with people. Uh, before we release things into the wild. And we're very data-driven as a company. So one of the very early things that we did at Hired, which proved to be incredibly uh, successful for us, is make all of our data available to all of our employees without them having to know SQL. So we bought a tool called Looker, um, which allows us to create dashboards and reports, and allows anybody, even non-technical users, to get answers to their data questions um, in a relatively easy and straightforward manner. So while we do have a pretty big business insights team, Everybody in the company has access to basically all of our data. So when they're making a prog decision, they're making a sales call, they can actually quote real live data from the company's performance and operating metrics. How does a, what are some um, examples of when you didn't have these kind of resources that we could implement in our own businesses aside from um, to try and um, improve the product along the way without, um, I don't know, just on a small scale? Yeah, I mean, if you don't have a full-time user researcher, you can go on usertesting.com and buy five recorded video sessions for a couple hundred dollars, as an example. You can purchase software that does click heat maps 
to see where people are visiting on a web page, what they're seeing, where they're clicking. You can do uh, video recording of user sign-up sessions, which is actually what a lot of product managers like doing on the evenings and weekends. Oddly enough, they watch people going through the flows and seeing where they make mistakes and the product errors out on them. And you can just look at a couple dozen videos at like 2x fast forward speed so you don't die from boredom. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and get a real understanding from your users. And it's shocking how few people like bother to go through that process. Like, it's one thing to kind of see the data, X many people bought my product, this many people churned the subscriptions, another thing to actually watch a video of the user interacting with the screens that you've built. That's great. Um, when validating a business idea that seems like it could be uh, viable, how do you decide whether to run with it or move to the next idea? I think you have to create basically the minimum viable product, and oftentimes it's nothing except a couple web forms and humans behind the scenes trying to make shit happen, even make it look automated. <laughs> What, um, can we turn the volume on? I got 10, 10 plus for that. Um, so what, so you said you're, all, you're very consumed with Hired.com right now. Um, Melbourne, Melbourne, what, what, what are some of the successes locally that we're, you're seeing? Like on um, um, Melbourne office, Sydney tomorrow. You're in Sydney tomorrow, yep. seeing, seeing those guys. And um, I'll throw it out to the audience because this thing's fucking up a bit. Any more questions from the audience? Harumba? Yeah. yeah. Um, so you've got employee number five. You've been able to find your first couple of employees by reaching out to your network. Most recruiters actually don't understand how to go, how to find uh, the right people and start leading. So how do you go from employee number five to number 20 without going to so the question for those that didn't hear was how do you go from five employees to 20 employees without a recruiter? A couple different things. Number one is you ask each and every one of your employees to sit down with their LinkedIn network and go through all their past coworkers and email people that they think would be a good fit for your business. If you've created a great culture and a business that people are passionate about, they should be eager and enthusiastic to refer in people that they've worked with in the past. Okay. Second of all, you can kind of reach out into cold emails to people using LinkedIn, using sourcing Dario, or using other tools can be very effective. Uh, third thing, for certain positions, job ads can be effective, not so for technical roles, um, but for other positions, marketing and sales roles, you can sometimes find great people. Um, if I'm a non-technical business guy, yes. how do I know I'm getting, how, what's the best way of me finding out that I'm getting a good developer? If you're a non-technical business guy and you're trying to recruit a developer, you need to find somebody who can do the interviews for you. You can pay them an hourly rate as a consultant, as a contractor. Um, you can give somebody equity in exchange for helping you hire and interview people. But you do need that one trusted person that can help assess. There's a big difference between a crap developer and a great It's a developer. huge, huge yep. difference. Take another question. Yep. You mentioned before how you went out to the developers first and then you went out to clients, right? Was yes. So when you start to build a marketplace, you generally try and go after what you think is going to be the hardest segment of the marketplace. Without the developers, given that they were in such demand, would be the high, hardest people to convince to sign up for a job matching platform. So we went after them first. It turns out that the companies were actually harder. That's a great, great question. Always the chicken and egg kind of thing that people want to know about marketplaces. Get a question. Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, some of you might have seen the news story that came out in the last day around Uber doing their first uh, self-driving truck delivery, which delivered uh, beer on a 50-mile route. Um, truck drivers are actually the number one profession among men in the United States. There's four million truck drivers that now Uber, through their auto acquisition, will potentially be displacing. I don't know what the answers are. I'm glad I'm not a politician. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so we spend tens of millions of dollars annually on marketing, online marketing, event marketing, where the Platinum or Diamond sponsor at every major US conference for developers and some in Europe now as well. 
We have the referral system that we've built out because we create such a great candy experience. People are eager to refer their friends to us in exchange for an incentive, which can range from Bose headphones to $500 airline vouchers. We can be very generous in our referral incentives, thankfully, given the economics of the business. And finally, PR can be very effective as well. So getting press and media attention. And the way you do that is not to gloat about yourself and how great you are and blah, 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 or that you raise money, though you can get press sometimes that way, but it's very kind of sporadic. The way to do that is through a scalable PR strategy that relies on data. Media love data. So if you do a survey or a quote or research and release that data to the media, you have a much, much higher likelihood of success in getting picked up. Does, does Hired see itself as going out across different verticals that's, that's down the track? Or? Yeah, absolutely. So there's any number of professions from accounting, financial services, professional services, and especially healthcare that we think are ripe for disruption. There's huge supply demand imbalances that a marketplace like Hired can address. And is that a matter of changing the product almost for different segments? I mean, the designer might want a different experience than a developer. There's definitely going to be some customization as we go across different verticals. So we've been very kind of paced and deliberate in our growth and not trying to go too fast and too broad because with a marketplace, you create a real um, strong possibility of creating a negative experience if you have a wrong supply demand imbalance. So it's really, really important that you can maintain equilibrium between both sides of the market. How do you and doing do that? that is tough. How do you do that? It's tough. So with Hired, one of the levers that we have is curation. So of all the people signing up on our platform, we only let through five to seven percent that are actually seen by employers. So 95 percent of people basically don't get the Hired experience right now because we don't support their scale. We don't support their geography. They have unrealistic expectations compared to what we've seen in the market. They're just kicking the tires and don't have a genuine interest in interviewing for a new position or any number of other reasons. So that's, that's why I didn't get a job. Take one more question. What was the question? How, do you, how did you take early, judge yourself in taking early advice early on in, early on in the business? So advice from other founders or advice from like, yeah, yeah, guidance. Um, so one of the things that we were very fortunate um, with having great investors is they actually hold regular founder summits for their portfolio companies over multiple days, usually in like nice places like Monterey or Sonoma. And that really provides a forum for people who are at kind of a similar growth stage to interact and learn with each other and really share honest feedback. Um, executive coaches can also be effective with a professional kind of executive coach that attended many of our meetings and worked one on one with the senior leadership along the way for a while. And that can be uh, very good. And finally, I think I'm a huge, huge proponent of reading. Not everything worthwhile is a 500 word medium blog post. There's some tremendous, tremendous books that you can buy for 15, 20, 30 dollars off of Amazon that can make you a better entrepreneur, a better executive, a better people manager, a better negotiator, a better salesperson. So I generally try and read two to four books a month. I have hundreds of books at home. If anybody's interested, I can share some of my favorites um, via email later on. But something that uh, if you make a habit out of it, um, you can really improve yourself a lot as an individual, Has as it, an entrepreneur and executive. Have you had mentors? You've had mentors along the way? Yeah, so one of my very early on mentors was Mark Carball, my business partner who I started uh, SitePoint with back in 1999, 2000. He was 10 years older than me. I was still in high school, so obviously it gained a lot from his experience and leadership in the early days of the business. And what happens when you're truly disrupting something and... Um... <laughs> if you can't guess my email address... <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah, you gotta have, take a break <laughs> at it. Um, the, um, I can't remember what we're talking about now. Um, what was the last question? We're talking about mentors? Yeah, mentors. So um, what, how, how, when you're disrupting, and this will be the last question here, um, when you're disrupting a business and you're going in an entirely different, different direction than you think anyone else has, how do you get help when you're in unknown territory? How do you, how do you recommend you know, the pioneers in the room keep going? There's very few problems that others haven't solved. Most problems in business come down to people problems, capital raising problems, recruiting problems, product management problems, operational problems, how do you set the goals, cascade OKRs. All of these things have been solved before. Um, the real innovation is really finding that product market fit early on. And that's through experimentation, determination, hard grit, and perseverance. Love it. I want everyone back on their feet and a big thank you to Matt for coming tonight. Come on.